Okay, so this video is for Unit 7, uh, Natural Selection, and let's go ahead and talk about uh, the first uh, essential knowledge, which is natural selection is a major mechanism of evolution. So when we talk about mechanisms of evolution, uh, first we need to figure out what evolution is. So evolution is defined as a change in the allele frequencies over time. Uh, that would be microevolution. And so when we talk about different mechanisms or ways that populations evolve, there are actually five different mechanisms. And natural selection is, is one of the major ones. Uh, the other ones would be gene flow, non-random mating or sexual selection, genetic drift, and mutations. So when we talk about natural selection, though, it is... Um, based on Darwin's theory of natural selection, which states that there's competition for limited resources and that results in a differential survival, which means that some individuals survive uh, better than others. Um, the individuals who do survive have favorable phenotypes um, and are more likely to survive and reproduce um, and therefore passing their traits on to subsequent or the next generations. So the key here in natural selection is the survive and reproduce, like a differential survival and reproduction. So it's not all equal. Some phenotypes are better at surviving and reproducing than others, and therefore their genes will be in the next generation. It's very important that you include over time or in the next generation uh, for this. And so when we talk about natural selection, though, it's also referred to as survival of the fittest. And when we define fitness, fitness is a measure of reproductive success. So uh, fitness has two parts. Um, the length, like how long they survive, but really it's how many offspring do they produce throughout their lifetime. So uh, many species... If you talk about a long life, generally speaking, they're also having offspring during that lifetime. Um, but really, it comes down to how many um, offspring are there. So if you are presented with a question about fitness, you're going to pick the answer that talks about the phenotype that has the most offspring. Like that is the most fit um, individual. Now, um, when we talk about... Uh, natural selection, though, we talk about uh, what is high fitness and what is low fitness, uh, that really comes down to the environment. So the environment is the selective pressure. It's what determines what is high fitness or low fitness. Um, and that environment can be both biotic or abiotic. So let's talk about this. So in an example of an uh, abiotic environment that would be like this fish that I have here. Uh, so these fish in a lake, um, the way wavelengths of light travel through water, um, the red and blue wavelengths disperse differently. So near the top of the water, uh, like bluer phenotypes will be selected for and have high fitness and are better able to survive because they kind of camouflage better. Um, and then at the lower wavelengths or the lower parts of the lake, the red phenotype has a higher fitness. So that's an abiotic environment um, putting selective pressures on who survives. Now, if we look at uh, the bird uh, beaks of the finches on the Galapagos Islands. Uh, an abiotic situation would be when there's an El Nino versus when there's a drought. So that's changes in weather, which is abiotic. And that change in rainfall affects the food source of the finches. And therefore, as the seasons go by, whatever seeds are available uh, determines which uh, beak size is high fitness. For example, during drought, the um, plants with large seeds are the more resistant to drought and therefore they're the ones who survive and produce seeds and therefore the finches with larger beaks are able to access that available energy and get food and therefore if they have food then they survive and they get to reproduce. Uh, during those drought conditions though, Finches with smaller beaks, they don't have the crushing power to break through the large seeds, and therefore their phenotype would be selected against. But environments do fluctuate, and they do change. And so when that drought ends and rains return, then the food source on these Galapagos Islands switch back to smaller seeds, where the small uh, finch, the small beak finches are selected for, and then the large beak uh, finches are selected against. So it can be fluctuating um, uh, and it just depends on the environment, what is high fitness at that time. 
So it's also important to point out that natural selection acts on phenotype. Um, I like this picture here because if you look at the brown uh, rabbits, when you see their brown phenotype, you can't tell if they're homozygous dominant or if they're heterozygous. And so with that, um, it is the phenotype that either gives them high or low uh, fitness. Now, um, when we talk here about this standard, it says environments change and apply selective pressures to populations. Um, a really famous example is the, um, it's called industrial melani melanization. I don't know, um, but it's with the peppered moths in England during the Industrial Revolution, where originally the lichens and the birch trees had a whitish bark, where if you were a peppered moth, you camouflaged well. But then when they started burning coal, a lot of the ash and air pollution both killed the lichens and darkened the trees, and therefore the darker phenotype uh, began to um, have high fitness and was selected for. So when we talk about um, the environments are the selective pressures, in this example, the environment are the birds, the predators, which is a, an abi or, ooh, which is a biotic example of a selective pressure. And so as the bird is flying by hunting moths, on the left side of my screen here, the pre-industrial revolution, the uh, peppered phenotype has high fitness and the dark phenotype is going to be eaten <laughs> as low fitness does not survive and reproduce. Versus in the post-industrial revolution, when the trees are darkened, uh, you can see the graph how over time, it's key, in evolution and natural selection, we're talking about over time, over the generations. So here you can see how the uh, peppered or the white phenotype decreases over time, whereas the dark phenotype increases over time because the trees, uh, the environment changed. So um, when we keep on going with this, uh, some phenotypic variations significantly increase or decrease fitness in particular environments. So I do want to point out that the, if the environment changes, then what is high or low fitness will also change, just like we saw with the moths. Um, and then here, we also have something called artificial selection. And in artificial selection, that's where humans are the selective pressures. Instead of the environment, it's us that we are choosing the traits we want to see in the next generation. Examples of how we domesticated uh, modern dogs from wolves throughout the last 10,000 years, or a lot of our domesticated farm animals or our crops are all through artificial selection. Um, each generation breeding the best or the ones with traits uh, we most prefer. And so like a cow that, like a dairy cow, whichever cow has the most milk production will be the one that's selected for and will keep their offspring in the next generation, et cetera. Um, or like corn or kale, <laughs> Brussels sprouts, those are all uh, uh, species that have been modified by humans through artificial selection. Now, when we talk about... Um, these selective pressures, though, if you think about different environments across or ecosystems across our globe, like if you think about a desert ecosystem or an ocean ecosystem or a rainforest ecosystem, um, like they have similar characteristics or properties. So let's go with rainforest. So that rainforest, if I said rainforest, right away you're thinking tropical and hot and humid and rainy and lots of biodiversity. And so that composes what we call a rainforest biome. Um, and so when we think about these different environments and the organisms living within them, because the environments are similar, that means that the organisms within are under similar environmental pressures. So we can take the example of this uh, sugar glider and on the left, and then the northern, I'm sorry, southern flying squirrel from North America. So they both live in like a temperate type forest. Think about not a rainforest, but a forest. And um, to go from like in, they live in the canopy. The canopy is called like the top part of a forest, the trees up high. <laughs> and as they like go from branch to branch, you can see how that extra flap of skin um, to help them glide would be selected for over generations. So living in similar environments, these two species um, have been like the extra flap of skin has been selected for in both of them separately. They are not, they do not share a common ancestor. The uh, sugar glider lives in Australia and the North American flying squirrels in North America. And so Australia broke off 
from the rest of the continents um, and separated before placental mammals evolved. So in Australia, we have marsupial mammals, I mean marsupials, and then in the rest of the world, we have placental mammals. So Australians, Australia's marsupials evolved separately from uh, placental mammals and therefore even though they look very similar it's not due to common ancestry but rather similar selective pressures in similar environments so this is called convergent evolution when two species evolve to look very similar uh, even though it's not due to common ancestry and um, uh, yeah, so that's convergent evolution, which is different than divergent evolution. In divergent evolution, they do share a common ancestor, but then they diverge and um, become different. So if you think about um, like the ancestor of modern large cats, right? So you have as they diverge, they move into different ecosystems. So now we have like panthers and cougars and mountain lions and jaguars and lions and tigers. So that would be like divergent evolution. Um, on a smaller scale. Um, another example of convergent would be, uh, like here you have the fish, reptile, and mammal. Uh, their streamlined body shape is selected for for speed in the water, so that's not due to common ancestry, but due to um, a similar environment. Now, I also wanna point out that convergent evolution is one of the reasons why using morphology to build phylogenetic trees is not always your best source of evidence. Convergent evolution can be misleading when uh, figuring out the evolutionary history of species. And so um, therefore molecular data is gonna be better for determining relatedness. For example, if you just found a sugar glider and a northern uh, flying squirrel, um, and you looked at them, you'd be like, oh yeah, they're related. But if you analyze their DNA, you'll find that they're actually very distantly related. So DNA is gonna be your better source. All right, and then evolution is also driven by random occurrences. Uh, so mutations is one of those first random occurrences. Now mutations constantly occur. And I think as humans, we hear the word mutation and we think a negative uh, effect, but in reality, mutations most of the time are neutral because they're happening in non-coding areas of our DNA or they could happen in an intron, and they're not expressed in actual proteins. Now, we also wanna think about mutations. Sure, if it's in like a critically important enzyme um, and that protein folds up not correctly and now a person is born with a deficiency, sure, that can happen. But mutations are also the ultimate source of variation. Mutations are what create the variation we see on Earth today. Uh, for example, the mutation that created blue eyes in humans is from about 6,000 years ago. Uh, and that was a neutral mutation. It didn't increase or decrease fitness, so it can just spread through the population. Um, but mutations, they, I, I really wanna emphasize, okay, mutations are random occurrences and just because um, an environment changes, a species cannot choose to have a mutation happen so that they match their new environment. Mutations would have to occur randomly, and then if they show up in the phenotype, can be selected for or against. Uh, and so organisms cannot choose to mutate and mutation rate is another thing. Uh, mutations happen at a pretty constant rate. We call this a molecular clock. So when you're looking at the speciation in species, um, you can estimate uh, how far back in time they shared a common ancestor based on how many mutations exist between them. So this mutation rate is pretty constant uh, throughout time except for certain things could increase the rate of mutation like radiation or chemical exposure or something like sometimes there are environmental things that could increase mutations, but generally speaking, mutation rate is a pretty constant thing. Um, okay, and then uh, another random occurrence would be genetic drift. Now genetic drift is non-selective. What non-selective means is that it's not there's no fitness involved. It's not selecting for or selecting against. So in non-selective, it means it's random. So we have two kinds of genetic drift. 
we have the bottleneck effect and we have the founder effect. In the bottleneck effect, you have this population that is greatly reduced by death, like 90% or something is uh, dies off and there's only a few survivors. Those survivors were not based on fitness. It was a random event. So for example, it could be due to overhunting, like with the northern elephant seals or the sea otters or the cheetahs. Um, they were hunted to near extinction with just a few survivors. Now, if you think about that original population and all the genetic diversity that existed, and then you have them just die off randomly, maybe getting hunted, and just whatever genes or alleles are in those few survivors are is the only variation that's there to repopulate the species. And so therefore, the next generation is going to have way less genetic diversity. And from that point on, sure, you can have crossing over, independent assortment, and random fertilization that can mix the existing genes in the gene pool, but the only new source of genetic variation would be mutations. And then the other type of genetic drift that's non-selective is the founder effect. And in the founder effect, this is where you have a few individuals, they move to a new area uh, and start a new population and they bring their alleles with them, right? Their genes are part of who they are. And in that new population, uh, the allele frequencies will be different than the original. Because remember, evolution is just a change in allele frequencies over the generations. So it doesn't always have to be bigger and faster and stronger. All right, so another random occurrence that will change allele frequencies is gene flow or migration. So with that, um, if you think about gene flow, it's when individuals move from one area to another. They like join another population and that changes the allele frequencies. Like here, I teach in Southern California and you can think about, think about the humans that were in Southern California 5,000 years ago and their gene pool and allele frequencies. And think about Southern California today and all of the movement of people into Southern California from around the entire world. We have a way more diverse gene pool uh, than we used to in this region. And so therefore that would be a change in the allele frequencies over time. Again, this is not due to fitness. This is just a movement of individuals into or out of an area, and therefore it changes the allele frequencies. Okay, um, so this uh, standard I always find a little bit difficult to explain. So let's think about it. It says, let's break it down. It says reduction of genetic variation. So uh, we're lowering the amount of variation that exists in a population. Uh, this can increase the differences between two populations of the same species. So let's go ahead and look at these three graphs at the bottom. So here, when we talk about natural selection, let's look at that first graph um, up here. So where it says phenotypes uh, for color and you have those five um, phenotypes of mice. So depending on the environment, you can have different outcomes of natural selection. So on the left at the bottom, we have directional selection where the darker phenotype is being favored. And on the right, we have a stabilizing selection where the medium phenotype is favored. But now let's look at the middle. This is called diversifying or disruptive selection. And in this one, the two extremes are being favored. Now, this is the one that ties into this standard. Let's think about it. So if the very light mouse and the darker mouse in their particular environments are being selected for. So within the population of light mice, um, you get less and less variation if, wait, how do I put my hands? If that light phenotype is being selected for, and then the dark phenotype is being selected for in the other population. So they have a reduction in variation between their populations, and this makes them more different. So it increases the difference between the populations of the same species. Now, it's this diversifying selection or disruptive selection that can lead to a speciation. If over time these two populations become so different, they no longer choose to mate, now speciation has occurred and they are two separate species. Okay, now let's go on. So it says mutations uh, result in genetic variation, which provides phenotypes on which natural selection can act. 
So that is just what I mentioned earlier. They're the ultimate source of variation. And therefore, uh, new phenotypes can be selected for or against, or they could just be neutral as well. So now let's go ahead and talk about um, how do we measure evolution, right? So I mentioned that evolution is a change in allele frequencies over time. So when we talk about allele frequencies changing, we need a way to measure them, and that's where Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium comes into play. So if we say a population is in Hardy-Weinberg, what we mean is that population is not evolving. That means there's, out of the five mechanisms of evolution, that means they are not occurring. There's no selection. There's no mutation. There's no migration. There's a large population size, which um, like negates or gets rid of genetic drift. And there's random mating. There's no sexual selection occurring. So all five of those would have to be true for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg. And when we think about this Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we have two formulas. We have our p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1, and we have p plus q equals 1. So when we talk about the gene pool in a population, and we look at the amount of dominant alleles and the amount or frequency of recessive alleles. So the frequency of recessive alleles is q, and the frequency of dominant alleles is p. So p plus q is 1, or it should equal 100% of the gene pool. Now the p squared, 2pq, and q squared is when you're talking about the frequency or how often certain individuals show up. So in a population like how many homozygous recessive individuals are there, that would be q squared. How many homozygous dominants is p squared. How many heterozygous are your 2pq. Now if the p and q change from one generation to the next, that is the evidence for evolution in a population. So you can see here with these different color flowers how the uh, P and Q changed over the generation. The allele frequencies changed and therefore evolution occurred. Now it's one of the five reasons is why that it occurred. It could have been random, uh, which would be genetic drift. It could have been natural selection. It could have been gene flow. Uh, so there's a couple of five different reasons or mechanisms uh, that could be the reason why this is changing. Now. Uh, let's keep going. So it says small populations are more susceptible to random environmental impact than large populations. So uh, as we go into ecology in Unit 8, and we talk about the survival and health of an ecosystem or a species or a community, uh, this idea of genetic variation and diversity is super important. The more variation that there is at the genetic level in a species, that means that there's more phenotypes as like options for natural selection and surviving in a changing world and changing environments. So if a population experiences a bottleneck like the cheetahs did and they lost a lot of their genetic variation and they have a very small population size, which is what we find in our endangered species across the, across the planet, um, being an endangered species and having a very small population and lacking that genetic diversity means you have less variation in phenotypes and therefore when our environments change due to uh, invasive species or climate change or habitat loss or pollution, um, they're at greater risk for extinction. And so, uh, um, yeah, genetic diversity is super important in populations and their survival. Okay. So um, now let's move on to a next area in Unit 7, so where we talk about um, evolution and evidence for it. So we have many different disciplines uh, that support evolution. We have geographical, which is what I was talking about earlier with convergent evolution, how in different uh, geographical areas, like uh, similar forest ecosystems, would both have natural selection favoring similar uh, phenotypes in those regions. You have geological, ooh, with the fossil record. Uh, we have physical evidence like homologous structures or vestigial organs. Ooh, biochemical, if you think about like uh, metabolic pathways and um, 
uh, the genetic code and protein synthesis. So we have our biochemical uh, data and then mathematical. So uh, there's lots of uh, oops, there's lots of evidence across many disciplines for evolution. Now, uh, one of those uh, geological are the the fossil record. In the fossil record, we can see uh, the age of fossils depending on how deep in the rock layers that it's found. Um, we also have the ability to do carbon uh, dating. So we can look at the decay of um, isotopes of carbon to see and estimate the age. And so there you go. So we have carbon-14 dating. And we can also use um, geographical data and see uh, where in the rock layers the fossils are found and compare them across uh, the globe. Now we also have morphological uh, data and morphological is talking about like shape or structure. So in morphological data, we have homologous structures and vestigial organs. So I love the blind cave fish. And in blind cave fish, uh, we can see that their ancestor had eyes, but they living in dark caves without light, um, not developing eyes was actually selected for as a, a high fitness way because it actually conserves resources. So these blind cave fish have eye sockets, but no eyes. So that eye socket is a vestigial structure. Now homologous structures are when um, similar like embryonic uh, sources or like um, like genes, they like you have similar genes that code for, in this case, we have like the front limb of different mammals, but they take different adult forms. So homologous structures, if you look at like the arm of a human, cat, whale, and bat, we're all mammals and these same bones, the humerus, radius, ulna, uh, etc., have different adult forms. Now, homologous structures are also found in plants uh, and different species. So, uh, homologous structures have um, similar origins but different adult forms. Okay. And then, um, oh, homologous structures would also be used in like divergent evolution. Uh, earlier I talked about convergent evolution, but in divergent evolution, uh, those similar structures, homologous structures will take different forms as evolution happens in different environments. Okay, so a comparison of DNA nucleotide sequences and or protein amino acid sequences provides evidence for evolution and common ancestry. Now in reality, uh, this is a stronger source of evidence compared to morphological data. Morphological data could be due to convergent evolution, but earlier I talked about mutations and molecular clocks and how mutations happen at a pretty constant rate. So you can compare DNA sequences to see how many mutations exist between species or because DNA codes for proteins, you can also compare the amino acid sequences and you can see um, how many differences exist and then infer from there how long these species have been separated evolutionarily or where, like who has the most recent common ancestor, etc. cetera. Okay, uh, then we go into Fundamental molecular and cellular features and processes are conserved across organisms. So when we look at like um, evidence for common ancestry across the different domains in life, we have um, different metabolic pathways like glycolysis and aerobic respiration. We have replication. If you think about like the genetic code um, and protein synthesis that is used in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes, it's universal. Um, and then we also have other types of structural and functional evidence that support relatedness of all domains. Um, so the fact that like all eukaryotes have membrane bound organelles that serve similar functions, or we have linear chromosomes in our eukaryotic cells. And the fact that eukaryotes also have genes that contain introns uh, that's conserved across all uh, eukaryote organisms. So when we look at this here, you can see the three domains of life. So bacteria and archaea fall under our prokaryotes, and then we have eukaryotes. And so you can see how there are a shared uh, derived traits that are found in all three domains of life. 
Now, it is also important to realize that uh, populations continue to evolve on planet Earth. Now, as humans, our lifetime spans, what, 70, 80 years? Uh, so if you're looking at the evolution of elephants, that might be hard to measure since they're pregnant for two years. So if you're measuring changes in populations over time, that'd be difficult to see within our lifetime. But we can see within our lifetime uh, evolution in species that reproduce really fast. So the example of antibiotic resistance is evolution happening right before our eyes or pesticide resistance um, or we can observe animals changing and responding to climate change. So they're evolving with their changing habitats or they're going extinct. Uh, and so we see this with different um, infectious disease. Uh, the uh, mutations, when you have rapidly reproducing populations, um, because there's more generations in a shorter amount of time, we can see those mutations occurring and those mutations will create new phenotypes that can like be selected for or selected against. So emerging diseases is um, uh, another example of how populations can continue to evolve. All right, so now we get to move into the part about phylogenetic trees and cladograms. So let's break this down. When we look at a phylogenetic tree, the lines represent time. So uh, this tree is on its side kind of so the left is like way far back in time and you can see the time scale along the bottom and so they show uh, how much time has evolved between like speciation events to have this evolution of sharks here um, and when we look at these cladograms or phylogenetic trees they also show us let's put my face here uh, shared derived traits um, that are present. And so if we look at like the antelope, bald eagle, and alligator, for example, they all share like jaws and lungs. But then feathers would be unique to the bald eagle line. So, or if you look at the left-hand side, I also want to point out that sometimes traits can also be lost. So in the evolution of snakes, uh, losing legs was actually selected for. It was a higher fitness. So therefore, sometimes like a shared trait can also be lost evolutionarily. Now I also want to point out outgroups. Outgroups are used um, in a tree kind of for comparison, but they're the one that is like the least related to all the rest. So here in the tree on the right, we have lampreys as the outgroup, and um, it doesn't share jaws, lungs, gizzards um, with the other species. And so that would be your outgroup, and it is the one that is most distantly related from the others. And when we look at like this uh, table on the left, um, this character trait table, or not character trait, sorry, this is uh, amino acid differences, it's going to be the organism with the most differences uh, that is going to be your out group. And so uh, in this case, if we look at, um, D. polylepis, they have 21 differences, then 18, 17, and 20. They're very different from the others, and so therefore that would be the out group. Now, when we look at this standard, though, it's talking about molecular data, typically provides a more accurate and reliable evidence than morphological, and that comes back to that convergent evolution being misleading about common ancestry. Now, phylogenetic trees also show us uh, when speciation has occurred. So when you have that branching point, that is where a speciation event happened, and that represents the last common ancestor between two organisms. Uh, and you should be able to use uh, these types of, um, what is this called, uh, tables in order to build a phylogenetic trees um, and cladograms. And so we also want to point out that phylogenetic trees and cladograms are hypotheses of what we think has happened, but as new evidence unfolds, um, that hypothesis can change. All right. Oh, now we're moving into speciation, one of my favorite topics. So when we define a species under the biological species concept, what we're saying is that these two groups, these two populations, they choose to interbreed and together they have viable fertile offspring. So there's two parts 
to a speciation and defining if two populations are the same species or not. So we have our pre-zygotic barriers and our post-zygotic barriers. So there, uh, if we have two populations and they never choose to mate, um, so there's never going to be a sperm fertilizing an egg, we call that a pre-zygotic barrier. Examples could be a geographic isolation, could be behavioral isolation in the case of these meadowlarks. They have different songs and different courtship rituals, so they do not choose to breed. Now, could they make viable fertile offspring? Probably, but because they sing different songs and they have different behaviors, they'll never actually mate. So you have behavioral, <laughs> that would be a behavioral isolation. We also have habitat isolation, where the habitats just don't overlap, and so therefore they never come in contact with each other. Um, like the lions in Africa and tigers in Asia, uh, they never actually overlap in their ecosystems. And then you could have temporal isolation where they um, reproduce at different seasons or different times. Could be times of day, different seasons, or different years. But because they reproduce and they make their gametes at different times, uh, therefore they never have a chance to fertilize. So that would be a prezygotic barrier. And then we have gametic isolation, which is important in water environments or the air, where if you think about um, fish that release their gametes into the water, so the, in gametic isolation, only gametes from the same species will form a zygote, where the sperm will be able to actually enter the egg. And then we have mechanical isolation. And in mechanical isolation, they need to actually physically fit together <laughs> in order to reproduce. So if they can't physically uh, mate, then that would be uh, another pre-zygotic barrier. Now for post-zygotic barriers, this is we see in the case of horses and donkeys. So with horses and donkeys, you have, um, uh, this would be hybrid uh, sterility, I think it's called, uh, where the hybrid is viable and strong, but it's not fertile. Uh, we also have um, reduced hybrid breakdown, um, where like the, or no, reduced hybrid viability, sorry, reduced hybrid viability, where there's a hybrid that forms, but it's weak and it's feeble and it doesn't develop. And then you have hybrid breakdown, where the F1 generation, the hybrid, is viable and fertile, but then it's the F2 generation that breaks down and you can't continue breeding hybrids together. So any reason why a species, uh, two populations, would not produce viable fertile offspring uh, makes those two populations different species. Okay, now when we talk about evolution, um, we have two different like kind of, I don't know if call them rates or different ways. Um, I'm not really sure what the term is for this, but we have uh, gradualism, which is basically what we've explained with natural selection, where you have gradual changes over time. But then there's also the situation of punctuated equilibrium. And in punctuated equilibrium, it's where you have like long periods of stasis, it's called. And in stasis, things are staying pretty even and stable. There's not a lot of ecological stress or pressures. So therefore, the organisms just live their life happily. And then in times of ecological stress, so for example, like climate change, you have a lot of environmental pressure selecting uh, for changes or like different phenotypes. And therefore you might have like rapid evolution. Um, but rapid evolution could be like 5,000 years. Uh, in the grand scheme of life and Earth being 4.6 billion years old, uh, this rapidly changing environment isn't rapid in our lifetimes. Okay, and now let's go ahead and talk about adaptive radiation. Ooh, and speciation. This is so pretty. So when we think about um, divergent evolution and new habitats, etc. Okay, so... Let's think about these finches on this uh, on the Galapagos Islands. So the islands are volcanic islands that um, were formed and underwent primary succession. So they have different habitats and ecosystems on the different islands of the Galapagos. Now you have the founder effect where some finches from South America about 500,000 years ago landed on the Galapagos Islands. 
Now, as the finches move to different islands, different islands have different elevations, different food sources, different weather. So therefore, the different populations on the different islands were under different selective pressures. They also evolved their own like behaviors for reproduction. Uh, they have their own mutations and genetic drift happening in these different populations. And therefore, today, 500,000 years later, we have 13 different species of finch on the Galapagos Islands. So this is an example of adaptive radiation where you have a species move in, like so finch, you have that move into new habitats and those new habitats have different selective pressures and now it's evolving into different species. That is adaptive radiation. We also saw this in the age of mammals about 60 million years ago, where when the dinosaurs went extinct, um, there was a lot of small rodent-like mammals that now were able to move into open niches and open habitats. And as they did, they had different selective pressures that now caused them to evolve to become different species. And so that would be an example of divergent evolution and adaptive radiation. When we talk about adaptive radiation, radiation is like moving into new areas. And you can think of the word adaptive kind of like adaptations being selected for through natural selection. Um, okay, so that's this happens after new habitats become available. We saw it with the formation of the Galapagos Islands, but also when the dinosaurs went extinct, that was a lot of predators dying off. So now there's all this open space to move into. Okay, and so uh, kind of same thing with large cats as they move into new territories. Oh, natural selection happens in different places. So when we look at speciation though, as we talk about this adaptive radiation and do they choose to mate or not, we have two uh, categories of speciation. You have sympatric or you have allopatric. And in sympatric speciation, they evolve to be different species while living together. This is gonna be due to reproductive isolation. They are choosing to not mate. Is it because of temporal? Is it behavioral? You know, what is gametic? Like what is happening for them to no longer um, have their gametes fertilized? So that's sympatric speciation. But we also have allopatric speciation. And in allopatric speciation, that occurs while the two groups are geographically isolated. So geographic isolation occurs, and if like they evolve independently, when they come back together, if they no longer choose to mate, well then speciation has occurred. Now this I've already kind of talked about um, pre, I don't know where I put my face, pre and post zygotic barriers. So your pre zygotic barriers or any reason why uh, a zygote would not form, that there's no sperm or egg forming a zygote. So that could be geographic, habitat, behavioral, temporal, mechanical, or gametic. And then you have, if the sperm does fertilize an egg, how come it's not forming a viable fertile offspring? Well, it could be because the um, hybrid is not fertile or it could be that the like so that would be in the case of like the mule uh, the hybrid is not viable so it's form but it's very weak and doesn't develop this is common in like if a sheep and a goat mate on the same farm the goat or the sheep one of them will get pregnant but there's no viable offspring born because there's not enough like of the correct proteins <laughs> during development to have proper cell division and specialization and then we have hybrid breakdown uh, where the first like the f1 is fine but then when an f1 and an f1 mate the f2 um, are not viable or fertile now extinctions uh, have happened throughout Earth's history. We've had five major extinctions and we are living in the sixth. Our uh, rate of extinction is very high right now. Uh, our planet is undergoing lots of ecological stress. As the human population undergoes exponential growth, we are spreading across the planet, which basically is driving extinctions. Uh, the number one cause of extinction is habitat loss across our planet. Number two is invasive species as humans move animals from one and plants from one place to another uh, when an invasive species moves in it can like overtake an ecosystem we have human population growth we are we are doubling in 58 years as a human 
as a human species. Um, pollution is a major cause of extinction. We have climate change and over harvesting. Uh, right now, we take about a quarter million sharks from the ocean every day. So in every four days, a million sharks are taken from our oceans. And those are top predators that keep uh, food webs and ecosystems in balance. So we are definitely driving extinction on planet Earth. Um, and uh, as we think about this, uh, the amount of diversity in an ecosystem can be determined by the rate of speciation and the rate of extinction. So when we have extinction, um, it does open and make way for the evolution of new species for adaptive radiation. So as we live in the sixth mass extinction, um, after we are dead and gone, new species will evolve in our new and different habitats um, as we change our planet Earth. Now, extinction does provide those open and available niches that can be exploited by different species. So here we can see an example of when extinction um, occurs, you have these open niches. So here, I like this graph because it shows at the Cretaceous period, when you have the dinosaurs go extinct, how now that like bulging of the mammals is like the age of mammals. They moved into open habitats and niches, and now um, that's like adaptive radiation. And when we look at this here, uh, the variation in a population helps that species um, survive, like changes in their environments. And so more genetically diverse populations are more resilient to this change, uh, hopefully because they have more phenotype-like options for natural selection. So they can withstand that pressure and change along with it. But again, just because the environment is changing doesn't mean that they can just will new mutations to show up to give them an advantage at surviving. If the mutations never show up, then they'll go extinct. Um, and then when we look at uh, the last couple slides here, um, variation affects uh, population dynamics and their ability to survive. We've kind of talked about that. Now, if we talk about the um, several hypotheses about the origin of life um, on Earth, we have like the Miller-Urey experiment where they take like the molecules that were present in early atmosphere and they spark them with electricity and they were actually able to have um, like polypeptides form. Uh, and then we have the RNA as the RNA world hypothesis, that RNA was the first genetic material, uh, the earliest genetic material, and some pieces of evidence for that would be that RNA is self-replicating. It can act as a ribozyme. Um, you can go from RNA to DNA or RNA to proteins. We have multiple kinds of RNA that serve different uh, functions, and RNA can be uh, catalytic um, when it acts as a ribozyme. So, uh, right now, the current world hypothesis was that RNA was the first genetic material over uh, DNA. All right, all right, that is it for Unit 7. Uh, great job.